right? Um, and uh, before I get going, I also want to point out in the agendas that you see that there were, um, uh, since we only have one presentation today, we are hoping to have more of a discussion around the uh, outlook, sea ice outlook, look at, thinking about whether or not uh, this particular product, there are things that we could be doing to uh, address a more general audience, some of the, you know, more of the stakeholders and uh, how the, the uh, product might be used to uh, facilitate some um, more collaboration between uh, the modeling and observing communities, spe uh, specifically helping direct the observing community as to where um, we might focus uh, data collection. So please keep those and any other questions in mind as you're listening to Ed's presentation. And at that, I will stop sharing my screen and um, Ed, you can go for it. All right. Thanks, Jackie. And, yes. Uh, um, uh, let's see. Where am I? Okay. I think hopefully that works for everyone. Um, so, um, uh, thanks, Jackie, for the introduction. And Sharon is paused. Uh, okay. I think hopefully. Can you see me? Yeah, that looks okay. great. Ed. Right, perfect. I, I don't know why it's asking me if I want to resume sharing, but um, it, it looks <laughs> like, it looks like I'm sharing. Um, so uh, uh, I'm Ed, I think you all know me. Um, and uh, th this is a pretty short summary um, on uh, this past summer uh, on the outlook and conditions. And um, I think uh, hopefully we'll have something a bit more detailed uh, as a postseason report at some point, like we've done other years. Um, but uh, anyhow, without further ado, I wanted to um, show you this plot uh, that um, courtesy of uh, Larry Hamilton. And this is showing the number of contributions that we've had every year uh, to the Arctic sea ice outlook. And this was our 10th year, so we started in 2008. And uh, well, the first thing that will pop up at you is- I'm the, at yeah. Jackie. And it did not move off the first slide. Ah. Um, there you go. Okay. Um, I don't know why I did that. Maybe I'll. Yeah, I'll go right ahead. I'll let you know if it doesn't do it again. Uh, does it, does it uh, change if I do that? I just changed. Yeah, we're on the slide with the bar graphs. Okay. So, yeah, so I just mentioned I want to show this to uh, show the, um, uh, the growth in the number of submissions we've had, and uh, uh, which has been about uh, threefold in, in, since we began in 2008. And uh, the other thing that you can see, uh, which I think is a good sign, is that uh, we're getting uh, a, lot of, a lot more contributions from um, uh, the model in and the statistical forecast. So if you, if you look at the, um, that sort of a dark blue color at the bottom, that's a heuristic forecast. And they've sort of uh, trended downward, and, um, which means that um, uh, you know, most of our submissions now are, are from uh, uh, either modeling or statistical forecasts. Um, and uh, the, the mixed forecasts are those that um, use a combination of modeling and statistical uh, techniques. Uh, but I think I think that's a, a, a pretty good sign, and especially uh, fully coupled models. So we didn't have any for the first couple of years. That uh, pink-ish chart, and uh, uh, you know now we're getting about uh, well over thirty submissions a summer, and uh, we have uh, I feel like we have now a sort of core group of about eight to ten modeling centers that are uh, you know have started sort of submitting us uh, forecasts uh, every year, which which I think is uh, great news, as I said. Um, so, uh, how are we actually doing? Uh, well, this is the, uh, uh, did you see the new slide? Nope. Okay. Um, do you see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what the best thing to do is I, I, we hadn't run into this problem in the, uh, in the practice. Um, so maybe, um, you know what? Let me see if I can do this. And also, you might try sharing your entire desktop and not just the PowerPoint. I'm not sure if that'll make a difference, but. Uh, okay. Um, okay. 
Okay, let's try that. Um, so hopefully everyone can see the actual time series here of the observations and the um, uh, CIS outlook forecast in the uh, kind of brownish air, uh, uh, sort of um, time series. Um, and please shout out me if you don't. Um, so uh, you can see that, uh, you know, that these are results that uh, were published by Larry Hamilton and Julian Struvi. And, um, you know, we, we've sort of found that, that the big anomaly years like 2012 or 2013, uh, they've been sort of forecast busts. Um, other years we've done pretty well. And uh, this year, 2017, you can see at the far right there, um, was sort of, a, I'd say, maybe a, a mixed result. Um, we were about 0.3 or 0.4 million square kilometers of the observations as a, as a median forecast. So when you, when you take all the uh, CIS outlook forecasts, um, but that's still less than the September uh, standard deviation of detrended CIS, which is about half a million square kilometers. So I, I think that's a, a positive sign that a, a forecast error was less than the uh, standard deviation. And uh, you can think of as a, a kind of crude estimate of scale or signal over noise is that, um, you know, if you're within a standard deviation, then that's, um, I think, I think you can be uh, reasonably positive about it. Uh, the other thing I noticed about this year is that um, wh one of the things I've been um, uh, curious about in other years is the, the amount of range that different forecasts have. And that's uh, symbolized by the, the spread of that sort of brown um, time series. Um, and you can see that this year, uh, the spread in the forecast, you know, it was still significant, uh, but it was less than we've had other years. And um, I, you know, I, I don't think we know uh, yet why that is, um, why essentially different uh, uh, forecast techniques that are basically trying to forecast the same thing uh, have such a spread. Um, and uh, we might discuss that a, bit, a little bit later. Um, Okay, and then uh, if you split this year's uh, forecasts by different techniques, um, uh, you, you get the, these are the results. And uh, generally, we were a little below the actual observed value. So as, as, I, as you sh showed here, we, you know, the forecasts were coming in around about 4.5, and the final, uh, the observation was 4.8 and change. And uh, so, so that sort of is symbolized here, most of those, um, most of those um, um, values are below the, the observations. Um, but you can see that um, the statistical forecasts did pretty well this year. Um, they, they kind of straddle the, uh, the observed value. And the dynamical forecasts were tended to be a little below uh, the actual observed value. And um, uh, you can see also the heuristic uh, forecasts were pretty, pretty low there. Um, now, Let's, uh, I wanted to mention a little bit, um, or talk a couple of minutes about sort of w how we got to the sum of 2017. And uh, basically, as I think you probably all uh, recall, uh, we had a really warm winter in 2017 with, uh, the, uh, with also very low sea ice extent values during the winter. So you can see the um, sea ice extent in, uh, in the Arctic in the top right, leading up to the middle of June more or less, or the end of June. And you can see that that blue line, which is 2017, uh, some really low values during the winter. And I, 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 I'm pretty sure, I, I, I think we had the lowest, uh, min, you know, the winter maximum sea ice extent. Um, and uh, you can see that by the end of June, uh, in the top left uh, sea ice concentration map there, we were, we were having pretty large areas of open, uh, open ocean uh, around the periphery of the, um, of the Arctic Basin. And, uh, and um, you know, if you, if you basically combine uh, those, uh, you know, the, those kind of tendencies in the size extent with the fact that we had a really warm winter uh, in, in the actual, uh, w or within the Arctic Basin, and uh, you can see the uh, degree day anomalies um, in that bottom panel, north of 80 degrees north, I feel there was a, 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 an understanding or an expectation back in, in May or June that we might be seeing a really low summer uh, sea ice extent uh, this past year, uh, you know, given these sort of preconditioning facts. 
And, and I wonder to which extent that affected, you know, if you look at those heuristic forecasts, they, you know, they tended to be pretty low, um, which to some extent, you know, was reflected a little bit by the other techniques, but maybe not, not, as not in such a pronounced way. Okay, so this is what uh, led us to, to the summer. And then the evolution over the summer itself uh, was uh, pretty interesting because we were tracking 2012 all the way pretty much to early August, or we were, you know, we were just behind, um, and you know, probably just by a few days uh, melt back until early August. And then uh, we diverged from the evolution of 2012 quite dramatically, and August actually saw relatively low uh, melt, or at least, you know, if you, if you, it kind of uh, kept pace with the uh, old climatology, the 81-2010 uh, uh, rate that, that you can see in the, in the bold gray line. And so that, that meant that by, you know, by September, uh, there was really no chance of, um, or by, you know, late August, there's no chance of breaking that 2012 record anymore. And we ended up with that um, sort of, uh, you know, value which, uh, you know, for a value of 4.8 in the, if you take the whole historical uh, time series, it's obviously very low, but in the context of the last 10 years, you could almost say it was a, it was a normal year. So this is quite interesting that we ended up with, um, you know, uh, with, with a low, but perhaps not dramatic low sea ice extent, despite that really warm winter and um, low sea ice extent uh, in the winter, which, you know, while it is uncorrelated with summer sea ice extent, um, you know, my, uh, those, Kind of conditions might lead you to think that probably spring had pretty thin sea ice and and maybe we would have had a, a very low summer sea ice extent um, now when you think about the summer um, one of the things i wanted to show uh, were these maps of uh, sea level pressure anomalies and um, you know there's been quite a bit of work um, done over the last 10-15 years showing that uh, if you have high pressure over the the arctic in the summer you probably enhance melt. And we've seen that in big years like 2007. And uh, this year was uh, quite a quite remarkable how persistent uh, the low sea level pressure anomalies were in, in a negative sense. Um, so negative anomalies, and particularly uh, July and August, uh, uh, well, well all, all three months are fairly similar to each other, but particularly July and August. Uh, but I thought it was, uh, you know, when you look at these maps, um, and when you go back to the sea ice extent melt rate, um, I first was looking at this plot and I thought, well, I wonder if August itself was quite cold and different to, to the other months in summer. Um, but uh, looking at these maps, it's, um, you know, I was perhaps somewhat surprised um, by these maps. So uh, I think it's an open question whether, you know, it was uh, the sea ice melt rate in August was responding, kind of integrating the, the forcing from the atmosphere over the, uh, you know, the whole summer. Um, and, uh, and I think it's also, you know, these, this leads to the, uh, to the question of the impact of single storms on the sea ice, um, because as you all know, this big, um, that big decline in 2012 in early August was related to this, uh, to that, uh, you know, the great cyclone of 2012. And we definitely had some big storms this summer, uh, but they don't really have that kind of impact on, on sea ice conditions. So, uh, you know, I think that's still um, very much an open research question. Okay, so having talked about that, I wanted to show uh, in the rest of my slides uh, the results from the uh, regional forecasts. And so this is something that I've been personally um, kind of collecting and uh, working with uh, different uh, modeling groups. And uh, I think, you know, we all uh, are fairly conscious that uh, from a stakeholder's perspective, uh, a sea ice extent forecast is somewhat limited. And what people want to know is, uh, you know, sort of regional forecasting, will there be ice or will there not be sea ice at this particular location? So we've been collecting these forecasts of sea ice probability, um, which is essentially the probability that the sea ice uh, concentration at the grid cell. So value of one is 100% probability that there'll be sea ice at that location in September and um, or that the, you know, the, the sea ice extent will be one. So I guess a concentration over 15% and a, a sip of zero is um, uh, zero ice. And what I show you here are the June forecasts. Um, we've got nine submissions for June and 11 for July, which both were all time records. 
which is great to see. And um, you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, sort of model spread in, um, in these kind of forecasts. And, uh, you, you know, you can kind of uh, pick and choose uh, on your favorite or, and, uh, and see different characteristics. For, for example, the, the NOAA CPC one, which is that third one in the top row, has you know some pretty interesting kind of characteristic um, or sort of CI um, uh features in terms of um, you know detail and other forecasts are pretty zonal um, and also the spread from a forecast of zero to a forecast of a hundred that varies a lot from one model to another right so if, if you look at the Met Office or the NOAA forecast in the at the top two panels in the in the top row there there's you know that the uh, the boundary between the zero and a hundred is, is, is large. Uh, whereas in other models like the NESM in the top left or the AWI in the bottom left, um, those are very constrained, right? So that, that gives you a sense that these forecasts have different ideas of the, the, the amount of forecast uncertainty. Obviously the, there's a bit more forecast uncertainty in the Met Office or the NOAA um, uh, submissions. Um, nevertheless, um, if you look at the uh, the bottom row, I I show you the uh, the mean of the forecast, and I think a useful metric is to the um, that last panel at the bottom right is the sigma, uh, which is essentially the standard deviation across all the single model forecasts, and I think these I think that's useful to get a sense of where the models are uncertain or you know where, where they're disagreeing with each other and where they're agreeing. And when you throw the uh, contour of the, the CI sets from this year, um, it's quite interesting if you, if you keep your eyes on that sigma panel at the bottom right, um, it's, it's, I think it's sort of a, a positive sign that, that the, the observed CI sets falls mostly within that kind of band of uncertainty, right? And in other words, um, within that band, you know, within the region, or if you even look at the mean, the mean forecast, um, and it basically says that where the mean forecast was 100% sea ice, actually that, that, that um, verified. And it also says that um, where the mean forecast was 0%, so the wide areas, that also verified with perhaps, you know, splitting has maybe the lapped FC, uh, the sea ice had stayed for, fairly for, um, relatively south in, in that area. And uh, the, the forecast will, the models were forecasting a bit more retreat there. Um, but I think, I, you know, I think it's powerful to look at these forecasts from a multi-model perspective um, with, with these metrics. Uh, now, the other interesting thing is um, that they, they didn't change very much throughout the summer. Uh, so the, these are the model means and those model uncertainty uh, metrics, but for the three uh, CIS outlook submissions, and maybe you'd expect that as the summer proceeded, uh, the kind of forecast would there'd be a tendency in those forecasts, but essentially um, we, we 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 see very little change um, in the forecast from June through August. And when you break it down, uh, I, I don't have it here, but when you break it down by single model, um, those tendencies, you know, so the change in forecast between the July and June forecast, uh, they're very small. Or if 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 there is a tendency, they tend to be different for different models. So one particular model might show a bit more sea ice um, in the July forecast, but another model will show less. So when you, when you take the mean of the model's forecast, then you end up with this. Um, I, would, I do want to say, though, that um, if you look at the bottom row and you see the model uncertainty, it does decrease a little bit as you go from June to August, which is what we'd expect theoretically. So as you, know, as you get closer to September, we should have more skillful forecasts and the models should converge. You know, they're all trying to forecast the same thing. So in, in theory that, you know, those values from left to right um, will see them decrease. And I just noticed there's no color bar here, so apologies for that. And again, if you put the CI sedge, uh, um, the observed CI sedge on, on top of that, then it, you know, it's, it's in a way, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good sign that it, it falls within that sort of band of uncertainty. Okay, and so how to quantify forecast accuracy? Um, well, one of the metrics we've been using has been the, uh, the so-called Briar score, uh, which is basically, you know, the, the difference between 
the probability you forecast and the observation uh, squared. And um, so a value of zero is a perfect forecast because you've forecasted either ice and there was ice or no ice and there was no ice and uh, a one, it's the opposite. And uh, so you can see that, um, you know, the, the regions that sort of light up uh, this year uh, were the Beaufort Sea. Uh, so in the Beaufort Sea, quite a few forecasts were um, uh, forecasting quite a bit more sea ice than we ended up seeing. And uh, you can see again, if I bring you back to this panel, and um, if you look at the, uh, the mean uh, in the Beaufort, where you see that sea ice heads fairly further north, uh, there was fairly high values of sea ice probability to there. Um, but um, the, um, the, the, the other thing I want to bring your, your attention to, um, the numbers on the X labels here are the, the sort of uh, basin uh, wide uh, mean Breyer scores. So uh, a value that's close to zero is, uh, has been a, or has um, verified as a better forecast than higher numbers. And we've done this over the last two years and um, I'll show you here all the values now. Uh, so these are for the uh, models that submitted us forecasts. These are the Breyer scores. So again, if you're closer to zero, uh, it's, a, it's a better forecast. And, and you can perhaps tease a tendency that those values are decreasing from June to August, uh, which, which again is, is a good sign. And then the other thing I want, uh, I want to show is that uh, if you take the, the model mean, so if you make a, a forecast using all the models, and uh, you plot those values on top, you can see that uh, often it's either the best or the you know in the top two or three forecasts. And th this is you know this is generic in other parts of uh, climate and weather forecasting, right? That the sort of multi-model mean does uh, pretty good, or you know because you're sort of uh, kind of cancelling opposite biases in in different models, and we we see that here too. And I think that's uh, kind of pretty encouraging. Okay. And so uh, uh, another thing uh, we did this year, and uh, which was kind of um, motivated by Frank Kauker last year, we split um, the model forecast by those that have assimilated sea ice into the data and those that haven't, because uh, not all of them. And, and by assimilating sea ice, uh, mo for most, in most cases, it's sea ice concentration. And uh, I'll show you in a bit last year's plot, but um, uh, we were curious to see how these two kind of different uh, forecasts compare to each other. And so in the red uh, um, chart, or the, or the red bar are those models that do assimilate sea ice conditions into the forecast and, and blacks, um, uh, the black models do not. And you can see um, the, the, the observed values of that top line. And you can actually see that well, two interesting things. One, that the models that do assimilate sea ice uh, do better than those that don't. Uh, but interestingly, they, with time, as they go from June to August, they actually get further away uh, from that uh, observed value of uh, 4.87. So, and, you know, they were forecasting slightly lower values as the summer uh, proceeded. And that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. And, you know, that sort of... Um, that makes one wonder if um, that kind of atmospheric forcing, the, those cold conditions in August that slowed down the melt rate, whether they were essentially unpredictable and um, perhaps not captured by the initial conditions uh, of these forecasts. Um, so uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. And I did want to put side by side um, with the results from last year. So this, um, the, the plot on the left uh, was done by Frank Kauker. Uh, so thanks to him. And um, last year was, um, well, the first result was the same. The models with uh, ice observation assimilations did better than those without. So that, that result is the same in both years. But you can see that last year, as we got closer to September, those models that assimilated sea ice uh, got better and better and, and actually got, um, you, you know, I mean, those forecasts are, are, by August are extremely good. Um, and um, and so so that that 's kind of a difference we 've seen across both years and, um, and uh, these are all very much uh, research questions as to um, you know what what's uh, what 's responsible for these issues but um, you know sort of uh, having the data to find these results uh, is is the first step um, that um, that I think we can be uh, pretty satisfied with and and I, as I say, I think it 
kind of raises a lot of uh, questions. Okay, so that uh, has uh, that kind of puts an end to the Arctic side of the talk. Uh, but I did want to finish by giving a, a, a sort of a highlighting one of the new uh, aspects of the CIS outlook, um, which uh, some of us are very excited about. And uh, so this year we started collecting um, forecasts of September. Uh, oh, sorry, of Antarctic uh, sea ice extent uh, for September too, for the same month. So obviously the it's the winter maximum there. And um, after a few years talking about this, we finally went ahead and did it. So, and thanks to Francois Massonet, who did a lot of work leading this. And um, I, I think uh, it's, it's quite fascinating because the range of forecasts we got for Antarctica, uh, they both cover uh, maximum or, you know, uh, all time positive and negative records. So you can see the time series, the historical record there on the left and then the, the three sets of our forecast for this year and uh, the very large spread, uh, even larger than we get for Arctic uh, sea ice forecast, which I think in itself is uh, very interesting. Um, but anyhow, I uh, just want to put that there and do to um, anyone that wasn't aware that we're doing Antarctica, well we are. Um, but uh, with that, that's the end of my presentation. Um, so um, I guess now we're open to discussion. Jackie, is that? Yeah. That? yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Ed, for uh, it's I'm like still absorbing it. So let me, uh, um, I, I, let's open the floor for questions or a comment. Ed, what was the uh, September Antarctic sea ice extent in 2017? Oh, um, that's a great question. I did, uh, I guess it's, wait, something happened to this plot. It's, uh, I think I'm still sharing this. So it's, it's the star, this star here. Uh, so it was, it's about 18.03. Um, there we are, 18.03 square kilometers. So the persistent forecast, the anomaly persistent, which I guess is your benchmark, uh, did extremely well. Uh, so that's this um, black value. So uh, as a, from, a, from the historical perspective, I think we were at the second lowest. So in uh, what's that? 1986. Uh, that was that's uh, still the record, but we almost beat it this year. So it's uh, it's it's kind of confirming that Antarctic sea ice seems to have taken a bit of a turn over the last uh, couple of years. Um, Ed, I have a there's a question on the chat. Um, it's from Bob Rich. He asks, "What do you mean by models which assimilate sea ice and solve them are predicting sea ice levels?" Right. Well, this is, um, well, they're, they're all forecasting sea ice, but some of them do not actually assimilate sea ice into the, So this is the information that is incorporated into the initial conditions. Uh, so that's what we mean by models that uh, either assimilate or do not assimilate sea ice. So they're actually taking observations. So, so they're right? taking observations, uh, normally it's sea ice concentration, because uh, we don't really have thickness in the spring uh, or late spring, early summer. So uh, some of them are assimilating CS concentrations and others, others are not. Okay, thank you. Other questions and comments? This is Jim, uh, a comment on the uh, low uh, sea level pressure, really different from the last 10 years, but uh, it's really what the climatology looked like before 2007. So, uh, you know, is this an outlier for this period when we've had low sea ice since 2007? We were we were really, you know, taking that. Uh, uh, you know, there was no Beaufort high in the summer before 2007, and we've seen that more recently, but this is really a, a throwback to 10 to 20 years ago. And, and so is this an outlier now, or, uh, you know, what does it mean that we went back to the old climatology? No. Uh well, open research question, Jim. No, it's just more of a comment that, 
Yeah, although I do think, uh, so these are anomalies from the whole, uh, I think I took the NSEP record, I, I put this figure together uh, very, not long ago. And um, so, so this, this does, um, you know, so I think, I think you would still see these anomalies relative to, you know, pre-2007. Um, I haven't had time to see exactly, you know, what, what kind of, you know, would it be the, in the top five uh, anomalous summers or top 10 or, so I haven't had time to do that, but I, I was still uh, somewhat, um, uh, I think it's still somewhat uh, remarkable how persistent that low anomaly was over the summer. Yeah, and is that, that right? It sort of points out that maybe the weather is still really random where uh, the loss of sea ice the last decade you know, didn't uh, really impact uh, uh, the meteorology above it. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jim. Other comments or questions? Uh, this is uh, Walt Meyer. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, you can, Walt. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted uh, to. Uh, uh, add or comment. Uh, I was going to do this in the uh, updates, but probably most relevant here um, that NSIDC recently, just this last week, um, updated their methodology um, for calculating the, the monthly extent. Um, and so the numbers change generally pretty small, um, but there are October is a month in the Arctic that changes quite a bit. Um, so, like the observed is now 4.80 instead of 4.87, okay. um, and the Antarctic changed a bit uh, as well. Can we go better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can. So I just want to let folks know I posted something on the Arctic uh, uh, news there, but just since uh, it's relevant and just to uh, so we're aware and in, in the final report we probably should adjust those and I can. I, I, we have a lot of documentation and everything on what changed and how much and, and why, um, but if people have other questions, they can contact me. Okay. Um, I see um, Richard, uh, you have a question? I had, you showed um, in one of your earlier slides that the statistical methods um, we're pretty close to the observed value. Um, would you agree that the statistical methods have gotten a lot better in recent years? Uh, I hope so. Um, yeah, uh, but but then again, it's you know because it's such a. It, I mean, it's it's a sample size of one, so uh, it's. I mean, I really don't. I, I think you have to, one would have to look at the bigger picture and um, you know maybe uh, quantify go back to quantifying the skill you know, over, over the whole 10 years of the CS outlook by technique, um, which I, I, I did, but just for the, um, for the modeling groups a couple of years ago, um, but I haven't updated since. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, both, you know, both statistical and dynamical models, I think have improved a lot. I mean, particularly, you know, I mean, they were almost non-existent 10 years ago. Um, so no, I, I do agree that the, you know, the, I think the progress is 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 definitely there, but I think I think you know one of the things that um, we still don't completely understand is the, uh, the the spread in the forecast, right? And I I I didn't have it here, but if you if you go back to the um, to the June report uh, to that you know to the famous uh, bar plot with all the thirty or thirty five forecasts on it, you know there's still a range. The, this year the range was from three point six to six. And you know that's a huge range of over two million square kilometers, which is four sigma. And you know it's it's like having a, a, a weather forecast, and one saying no, it's going to be really hot, and the other one's pretty cold. Uh, so, um, and I know, I mean, I know those are the extremes uh, of those thirty-five forecasts, and and a lot of models did converge around four point five, or you know between low force and high force. Uh, but I think understanding why why one uh, model. Uh, gives you one answer and another model gives you a, a very different answer. I, th I think I think that's one way we can uh, do quite a bit of progress. And uh, I did want to mention, I, I, I thought the talk was already technical enough. Um, I didn't include any, um, we did some work this summer collecting the actual initial conditions uh, of different groups. So we invited uh, the modeling centers that submit forecasts to, um, 
to share their initial conditions with us. And it was quite interesting that, uh, yes, there was quite a bit of spread in the initial conditions. Um, uh, so we looked at sea ice thickness and there was quite a bit of spread. But interestingly, the actual forecast value was not really correlated with how much uh, thickness uh, or you know how thick the ice was in those initial conditions. And uh, maybe that's not so surprising because we do know that each group, um, you know, the sort of um, uh, the forecast, um, you know, you know the, uh, the the kind of statistical technique to um, uh, the sort of bias correction that's done is particular to each group. So, uh, you know, perhaps that's not surprising, but it is uh, nevertheless, I think, interesting. And I think that's one way we can hopefully learn learn more about uh, and, and improve uh, the forecasts. Just had a couple of quick comments. Um, I'm right in thinking that some of the probability maps are produced statistically, so not all of those were dynamical models. Um, I think uh, I think this year we all had dynamical models. So so other years, um, last year, uh, uh, where we had a uh, uh, poor old Drew Slater's uh, forecast, and his was statistical, and. But I think this year, um, if the L one might be, um, oh, the the are we yeah. So that that might be the mixed. Um, I mean, some of them are just isolation models. Um, now, off the top of my head, I can't remember the details of. Um, but if, uh, do you know CC? Then a joint. No, I don't. Yeah, that um, I don't think they're like a purely statistical. Uh, for, for, oh, well, I'm sure they're not. I, I know they're not purely statistical forecasts, but now I can't remember if they're uh, what we might call mixed. Um, but uh, I mean, the, it's, uh, the documentation on the website um, is there if you if you want to check that out. But yeah, mo most of these are dynamical models. And then yeah, I had another quick quick question. Was um, I was talking a bit with Francois the other day about the Antarctic forecast plans, and um, he was talking about the. I think he wants to solicit forecasts of the daily extent across February. So instead of the monthly means, he wants to instead solicit like 30 different forecasts of the daily extent to try and somehow better see how well we can, I guess, predict the kind of weather, <laughs> um, which seems like a, a pretty tough challenge. Um, don't know if you had any comments or thoughts about that. Uh, well, I, I didn't know um, <laughs> about that. Um, and I'd have to think a little bit more about him. Um, He's a, he's a pretty smart cookie, so I'm sure there's been some thought behind it. Um, but uh, I mean, you know, I mean, sea ice, I mean, I mean, I guess February, that would be the summer minimum in Antarctica. Um, so I don't know, I don't, I don't know exactly what his uh, kind of uh, thoughts are behind that, because I mean, sea ice anomalies have a fairly long persistence time scale, so I don't know how much they're going to change over a, a couple of weeks. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that's an interesting, uh, um, kind of uh, a thought. I'd love to ask him about it. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I have one. Looking, uh, well, I have a few, but I'll start with one here. <laughs> Looking at the uncertainty and talking about the fact that the Beaufort area is one area that looked, you know, a particularly challenging. Just a comment from an observationalist. I mean, we've spent a ton of time in the Beaufort Sea, um, you know, making observations and trying to understand what's going on there regionally. Can you, what does that say about, you know, an area that I would think that uh, you know, we feel like we know a lot about, relatively speaking, but that seems to be a particularly challenging area to model. Right. Well, I mean, again, again as, I, as I mentioned before, it's, it's, a, it's a one sample forecast. Uh, so I don't know how much to, uh, you know, take out of that, that the fact that this year the Beaufort seemed kind of, there was uncertainty there. Because if you look at these uh, sigma maps, um, so you know that you know not just uncertainty in the forecast itself, but across the different models. Last year was a little different. So last year the models were more uncertain in the lap depth mm -hmm. um, than in the Beaufort. I mean, it's it's not by much, um, but it, it did it, it did uh, change a little bit from last year to this year. And and I don't you know I don't know that it's uncertain because of you know how we know or how well it know 
the physical mechanism behind it could you know it could be uh, um, uh, the data uh, that goes into into the forecast um, but uh, yeah no that's um you, you know the question as to whether are some regions inherently more unpredictable than others um, I, you know I think that's still uh, uh, definitely or probably definitely open uh, you know one of the things we've noticed is that the um, the forecast of the sea ice edge al along the Atlantic side you know like around Svalbard yep. uh, and you know Barents Cara uh, they are they're always a little less um, you know the models agree with each other and with the observations uh, better there but it's also you know if you look at the climatology there's also less spread there in that sea ice edge in in that region right so um, you know so it's it doesn't really mean that we know it better. It's just that the system's less um, variable in you know that sea ice edge in that location or in that region. Um, so as to whether there's something to um, something specific to think that we didn't get right in the Beaufort this year, I, I, I wouldn't really interpret it that way. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you know, yeah, sometime down the line, um, you know, like like nowadays with weather forecasts. If you have a forecast bus, you can actually sort of backtrack and find the region um, that kind of led, or, or, or you know, uh, what led to that specific forecast bus. And we might get to a point where we can do that with sea ice. But I, I think um, where we are now, I, I don't know that we can do much more than um, than sort of what we're doing right now. <laughs> um, and, and you know, so if you look at say the RASM forecast, uh, well, that did pretty well. Um, uh, in the Beaufort, right? Or, or even the GFDL NOAA one in the top right there. And um, uh, others didn't. Uh, or the NOAA CPC, it's got that pretty amazing tongue coming down yeah. the uh, East Beaufort. And uh, and that looks pretty realistic and actually kind of close to what happened. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think, but, but um, yeah, I, I don't know that you can go beyond what, uh, or sort of, yeah, I don't think you can claim, well, you know, we're missing this sort of process that we actually do know because we've observed it. So if we got that right, then we'd get their forecast right. Yeah, well, kind of circling back on some of the, but, the, the questions that we had on the, you know, on the agenda with regard to just how SIPN is, um, you know, operating. How, how is, how, what is the interaction with the, um, you know, the, the, the stakeholder community. So let me say, you know, folks that are outside kind of the observing and the modeling communities, but actually are the users. And you had mentioned, Ed, yourself that, you know, these users are really looking for regional forecasts. And, you know, are, are, are there conversations going on with that particular community about what they want to see out of these products and how the products might be um, you know, um, ha be augmented in a way that addresses some of those needs? Um, I, I'm not really the person to answer that question. Um, I think Cece is sitting but, behind you. I got the sense she, she, she is. She is. Um, I don't know if she wants to comment about stakeholders. Or, oh. It's, it's um, it, I don't think it's... Um, well, this is a personal opinion, but I, I don't think it's as... Uh, there's as much communication as the uh, well as probably the stockholders would like that to be or as we would probably like that to be too um, and I, I you know because it's such an early product and uh, you know there's some of us are very careful to say it's not operational right so I don't know whether that is uh, I, I a feature but. we are very eager to provide products that are more useful for stakeholders and a real um, I think force, a, a, a real uh, approach that, that we want to take this year in 2018 would be to provide shorter term forecasts to try to get more of these features that we think we can predict with skill that are probably of interest. And um, you know, recognizing that the, the further out the forecast is, you know, we should view it as um, much more probabilistic and therefore probably only look at very large regions mm -hmm. you know in the long longer lead times of it in the shorter lead times I think we do have some potential to get a lot of useful information and we'd like to, to fill that gap in the CIS outlook 
And this is, Jim, in terms of your what was unusual this year, there there were some edge effects that uh, there were southerly winds, especially early uh, coming into the Chukchi uh, Beaufort, and and so there actually was a bit of a memory of the initial conditions for the final uh, Chukchi. Uh, area. The, the other one that was really weird to me was uh, the kerosene sort of starting in the middle of summer. There wasn't any uh, uh, much more loss of uh, ice over over there. Uh, there wasn't a, a real seasonal cycle. So, so one one of the questions, uh, you know, for stakeholders. In Alaska, is you know now we've had several years, including uh, this one, where the anomalies and loss uh, percentage-wise are are bigger in that area than than in the overall uh, Arctic. So uh, even though there was a bit of southerly winds uh, uh, in the Alaska sector. This year, it's you know, are we getting close to the point where we want to say that uh, uh, you know, that the check is really going to uh, a new minimum uh, every year from now on, whether we can say that or not? Comments from anybody? Um, Actually, uh, uh, this is Hayo. I, I, I had my hand raised. I wasn't sure what, what the proper etiquette is, but I. I oh, I'm sorry, I'm not. I haven't figured out the electronic hand. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I have both a comment and a question to um, Ed. The one thing is, you know, if you go back to the CS probability slide you showed just prior, um, you know, you commented on this said, hey, um, you know, if you compare like. NOAA's CPC matches that tail of, of ice, you know, and then other models look good and so forth. And, and I think that's the key question that we need to be aware of is, I mean, different groups of, of ice users or, or ocean users or call in stakeholders have very different aspects of the ice cover that they're interested in. It's, 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 it's dangerous to sort of assume that, well, you know, if we plot the 30% or 15% ice concentration contour and look at how well a specific pr prediction is able to replicate that, that means the model is performing well or not. So part of the, the challenge, I think, is, is actually figuring out from different users of this type of information what specifically constrains or impacts their operations. And that isn't always trivial. I, I would point to Nathan Kettle here at International Arctic Research Center at IR, uh, just now has a project uh, started where he's specifically looking at operators off the North Slope in terms of the types of information that's useful to them from, from an operations perspective. And so he's gonna be interviewing, I think on the order of a couple of dozen different operators, you know, mostly in the maritime industry uh, with respect to what, what, what type of information is actually useful to them um, in in the shoulder seasons um, in in that area, so so that'll be that'll be interesting to um, hear from. But but the question uh, to Ed was, have you looked at all at how these different models performed over the past, I guess, three or four years that this CS probability um, comparison has been done? I mean, do you notice whether some models always exhibit, let's say, the, 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 the fine detail that you see in some of them, whereas others always show much, much more of, of a zonal yeah. kind of washed out appearance? Uh, or does that vary? I, I, I sort of, I haven't quantified that, but my gut feeling is that the, 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 that is the case indeed. And, you know, you, you have to remember also, uh, these are all plotted on the native resolutions and you know all these models are running at different resolutions and I think I think one of the things I have noticed is that uh, you know perhaps quite logically the the lower resolution models tend to have more sort of zonal feature like um, forecasts and um, 
for example, the Met Office one there, uh, that's run on pretty high, or, or the no RCPC. Um, although, uh, having said that, CC just pointed out to me that so is the uh, the NESM in the top left. That's also very high resolution. So, uh, you know, it's probably not that simple of an answer that it's just resolution related. Um, but no, that's a that's a really good um, point, Hayo. And you know, this is only so I think the third or the fourth summer that we've had these forecasts, and only now we're starting, I think, to have a database that we can answer that question you know like uh what, what is the consistency from year to year of of these different um of these different groups um so you know but but we know you know still it'll, it'll be a sample size of less than 10 um but you know it's, it's the best we can do so you know four month lead time here which i think these are all well, three months they were for, yeah. given in june for september the only way those little features are present in those early forecasts is if it's in the thickness field, pretty much, right? Right. And since we have such limited observations of thickness, um, that only could really come about if the, the historic history behind, you know, the last 10 months really built up the thickness there in those models. So I think that's a really key um, aspect to this problem is, are we, are we getting, the history behind you know these forecasts correct um, either through data assimilation or just good forecasts so or good modeling up until the time of the, the initial condition anyway i think we're getting better at it but it's we have room to improve yeah uh, but, but, and hi i also wanted to second your comment that um in terms of what actual metrics these stakeholders are interested could be very different and i totally agree and um uh, you know, we sort of, we, I remember when we started asking for the CS probability maps, uh, that was sort of, I, th I think that was coming from a scientist perspective. It was like, well, we know we need something more sophisticated and regional than extent. What's the next obvious step? And, and we came up with this. But I, I totally understand your point. And, you know, maybe um, regions above a threshold thickness, uh, say half a meter, would be more useful to some stakeholders. Um, so, so yeah. Thanks. We have time, I think, for one more question. I see that, uh, uh Richard, you had another question. Um, thanks. I think Hayo touched on most of my question, but it's still looking at Ed's plot here. It's very difficult to record to reconcile this with the, the classic bar plot of the, uh, Arctic average values. Um, is regridding still a, a problem here with uh, with computing the uh, the Arctic averages uh, for uh, the various models which have different land sea masks and different resolutions? Uh, most likely, yes. Um, but uh, I haven't looked at that in in detail. Um, but I was thinking actually about that, and if you if you computed an extent from these maps. Um, if you, I mean, if you look at the mean, uh, you know, if you look at the mean plot down there, uh, you, you see that over most of the sea ice edge, uh, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're forecasting a lower CS probability than, than observed apart from say the Beaufort. So I think, I think if you computed extent from these, you'd probably get a value slightly lower than, than the observations, which does agree with the, um, say with, with the actual, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at purely the extent forecast here, which were, you know, uh, low by about uh, a few hundred thousand square kilometers. Um, but yeah, uh, when, you, yeah, yeah, the whole regreeding issues, um, well, it's not gonna go away, because uh, groups are not gonna, uh, I mean, everyone's got their own native grids that they, that they run the models on. Um, but yeah, particularly uh, with dealing with areas like the Canadian archipelago, um, I mean, not that, not that a global model is appropriate to simulate that region anyway. Um, that's, um, yeah, that's probably still has um, a bit of an issue, which I think is why we ask, um, you know, separately for the extent forecast and, and the CS probability forecast. Thanks. 
Well, this has been a great discussion, um, spurred on from an excellent talk. Thanks so much, Ed. I think we could all keep going, but we have to come to an end. Um, certainly, um, please, if you have additional questions, uh, you're welcome to, you know, send them in, and I'm sure Ed will um, answer them, or we'll see that they get answered. Um, you can. Um put questions in the comment section of the the meeting and I'll send a link to that and everyone should be able to see those there. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you so much everybody for attending. Our next meeting is on the 27th of uh, November um, and the topic's yet to be determined. If you have suggestions of what you'd like to discuss, uh, let us know. Obviously, there's a little time for us to to work it out. So again, thanks for your attendance today. Um, we hope that you'll come in November and bring a friend so that we can continue to expand the, the conversation among uh, the CIS community and beyond. Thanks so much.